Jerry Williams, thank you very much for joining me today and welcome to the channel. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Let's go back to square one and let's start by getting to know you better. Can you paint me a vivid picture of yourself and maybe a little bit of your experience and what have you been doing throughout your life? Well, thanks for having me. I was an FBI agent, a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, for 26 years. I spent most of that time in Philadelphia, where I was assigned to working economic crime. And that's your Ponzi schemes, your advance fee scams, your frauds, your embezzlements, and your telemarketing, your business-to-business -business telemarketing fraud. I was assigned that initial uh, squad to be on that initial squad, but I grew to love it and to really develop an expertise in working those type of cases. And uh, it just became uh, uh, what I did in the FBI. Now, as agents, we get to work a variety of things because when a body is needed, you know, uh, you can jump on to a drug raid or an intelligence search or, you know, you can really be involved in anything that you want to uh, learn about. But again, I concentrated most of my career on working frauds and uh, corporate corruption type cases. Okay, very interesting. Mm, you mentioned something about telemarketing frauds. Would that mm -hmm. be something that people do these days when they cheat old people or people that don't have experience about online activities into pursuing them to give personal details, credit card details to steal money from them. You mentioned though B2B, but uh, could you perhaps maybe drill a little further into maybe picturing a story or give us an example just for, for the yeah. listeners? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely talked about business of business telemarketing fraud because that's what I did. And these are fraud at a larger scale. When you talk about, normally talk about telemarketing fraud, you're thinking about the person who calls the elderly person and kind of wipes up their bank account. But these business to business telemarketing frauds are where you might have a telemarketing company in one state and they just call all these different businesses trying to get them to order products that are overpriced. They may overbill them or they may even be able to uh, to corrupt the procurement officer at that company and actually have them invoice their business, their company, their employer for items that are never even shipped. And that's what I was doing when I worked my group two uh, business to business telemarketing fraud uh, operation. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it involved uh, lots of uh, agents on my squad assisting in different personas for us to pretend that we were victims. It was a uh, uh, kind of a many undercover roles that we played because we weren't doing it in person. We were doing it over the phone, including myself as the case agent, got to play a number of roles. It was an exciting case. And at the end, we had about 27 different subjects that were convicted uh, many of them that, uh, you know, ended up in jail. So it was really a great experience. And the, one of the fun things about it was that I got to train a number of brand new agents that were coming into the office at the time who got to have a taste of what it's like to participate in a large case uh, such as the one that I was working on. So uh, yeah, that was fun. But telemarketing has uh, really grown. Telemarketing fraud, I should say, has really grown since that time because when I was doing it, it was basically through the telephone or through the mail. And of course now, you know, it's online, it's through texting, it's through email, and uh, it really has taken off. And there are so many ways that uh, there are people out there around the world who are trying to take our money, trying to defraud us. And every time you turn around, there's a new scheme, a new scam. And you know, we've got to be careful. Okay. And would you mind telling me about where you grew up and what your childhood was like? And how did it lead you to become an FBI agent? When did it start? 
Yeah, that's an interesting story because I come from a really different background. My father was in the Air Force. He was in the Air Force for over 20 years. And so my childhood meant that I was moving at least every two or three years, never lived anywhere for more than three years. So um, I was born in Washington, D.C. at Bowling Air Force Base. And then we went to Morocco, Casablanca. Then we were in Chateau, France. Then we were back in the, the States, in Maine and Massachusetts, and we went to England, then we went to Germany, and then we went to Washington State. And finally, my father retired in Virginia, where he's from. And so I went to high school for my last couple of years of high school in uh, Hampton, Virginia. And so very, very, very uh, uh extraordinary childhood of getting to travel around the country and around the world. Uh, I went to Morgan State University in Baltimore, where I majored in psychology. And then I came back home to Virginia and got a fantastic job as a juvenile probation officer. What about school? Did they inspire you in a way, prepare you for who you were or who you are as an FBI agent? Or was this purely out of nowhere that it was your dream and you suddenly said, okay, I'm going to be a common FBI agent and I'm going to pursue this and um, reach nah, it was, It was really out of left field. I knew I you know, wanted to major in psychology in college. I actually did, I wasn't a pre-med major, but I took all of those courses, the, all of the science courses, including organic chemistry, which I did really well in. And, uh, but what stopped me cold from taking that uh, education and going to medical school was the second semester of physics. I just couldn't get it. I just couldn't get through it. Um, and I didn't need it to graduate. And so I dropped the, the second semester figuring I would take Uh, the course after I graduated. Again, I was a psychology major. I certainly didn't need physics. And that was a mistake because once I graduated, then I really, uh, you know, the only motivation I had was the thought of maybe, you know, applying for medical school. But with working now and, you know, establish, establishing a social life when in, in, in a new area where I had moved, I just couldn't get through the second semester of physics again. So uh, I did not uh, apply for medical school. I did not uh, become a doctor. And I have absolutely zero regrets uh, because of it. Uh, you know, that I don't consider that a failure. It's just, uh, you know, I, I, I got motivated to uh, use my psychology skills, you know, in, uh, in the law enforcement criminal justice uh, area. and. Um, Uh, are my law enforcement skills, uh, my, my psychology skills in the law enforcement field. And uh, so as a juvenile probation officer, uh, I was very young. I was really an aftercare counselor, which means that I got the kids that went away to reform schools and group homes that had been adjudicated for doing some type of a crime, whether that was home invasions or you know, assaults or violent, any type of violent crime. Many of the girls which who were young, which we know now were involved in sexual abuse uh, situations, but, you know, at the time were sex workers. Uh, I had those kids. They were away at different reform schools and placements throughout Virginia. I traveled around to visit them and then help them uh, initiate or incorporate themselves back into the community when they, you know, return after they've done their, their time away. Um, It was a really challenging job because you're working with young people, troubled young people who in almost all the situations came from, you know, very dysfunctional homes. And I was young at the time, 23, 24, 25, very young myself. And I could see myself burning out so quickly. And It was a choice of knowing that I was going to burn out and then maybe become like some of the people that were still there that had been there for a long time that seemed detached and unemotional. Now I know why, <laughs> you know, because you can't give, give, give your emotions that way without, you know, losing something, you know, in, in yourself. But um, uh, I started looking around for possible other positions 
where I could use my psychology, the, the experience that I had gained by working in a quasi law enforcement position. And one day I saw a newsletter that said that the FBI was looking for women and minorities. And I said, check, check, that's me. So I gave the recruiter a call. Okay. So you mentioned during your message, uh, regrets, if you were to go back in time, do you think the things you would do differently or were you quite happy and satisfied how your life progressed and evolved throughout your personal experience or career in general? Well, you know, you always think about those, you know, TV shows and movies where people go back in time to fix something, but they never talk about the fact that fixing that regret or that failure or that mistake or something that didn't happen in the past could totally alter what your present looks like or what your future looks like. And so I say no, because, you know, what's my present looks like and what my future looks like <laughs> from what I can see, um, I wouldn't want to change a thing. So there is nothing that I would change in the past because I would be afraid that it would alter, you know, what is going on in my life now. And life's good. I'm, I'm really you know, happy and in a happy place. So I wouldn't want to take the chance or the risk of, uh, of doing anything that would stop me from being where I am now, because I'm happy, I'm very happy. Okay. <laughs> and what career advice would you give particularly the younger generation, whether it would be <sighs> becoming an FBI agent or picking a career in general? Well, I'm sure you've heard the saying that if you find something that you'll love, something that really makes you happy, something that motivates you to get out of bed every day, then you will never work a, a day in your life. And so that's what I would say is just to, to take the time. Don't be so concerned about making money or, or you know, impressing your friends or uh, just doing something that seems that, you know, people would be, you know, impressed with you, find something that you love and then find a way to get paid to do that. And that is, uh, that would be my advice. Um, I think more so now than ever before, people are looking for positions that are going to make them happy. Happiness seems to be a really big goal now. It used to be, you know, when I was, uh, you know, back in the day when I was starting to work that people just wanted to find something that would help support themselves and their family. But now the quality of life, you know, what you're doing, what makes you happy is, is just as important. And I know a lot of this that I'm saying is more of a, an, an American thing. Um, and I think in, in Europe, you know, since I have a lot of people that I know and a lot of friends, you know, from, uh, from Europe, uh, they've all that they're, the mindset is more about that balance of being happy and, and not being all about what you do or, you know, your work. Uh, but we're just starting to get there now in, in the, in the U S and I think it's very important for you to find something that you really enjoy doing that is going to make you feel ha happy about you know, getting dressed and getting up in the morning, getting dressed and going to work. So. Okay. So would you say this would be the key to our fulfilling and successful life? Or yeah, I would say that, but also remembering that what you do is not necessarily, you know, who you are. And so also finding things that you enjoy to do outside of work not being all about the job and all about the profession and all about, you know, your titles, but also finding things that you enjoy doing, whether it be, you know, running marathons or <laughs> playing pickleball or traveling or reading or writing books. And uh, definitely something that I started doing after I retired because I just didn't, I wasn't able to find the time to, to do it while I was working. But once I, uh, I stopped working, then I let my creative juices start flowing. And uh, I'm really, really happy as to what I'm doing now and how I've been able to incorporate what I'm doing now with 
my career and what I did in the past. That's that's really special to be able to do both. Okay, you tapped into the creative area after you retired. You've uh, written numerous books. If someone would want to tap into your brain and get to know you, tell me which books they should read first and which books you would recommend mm -hmm. that you have written and what are they all about? Okay, so I've written, I've actually written five books. Four have been published. The fifth one right now is, you know, being uh, shopped around by my agent, you know, trying to find a find a publisher, and I, and I hope that happens soon because it's a stressful time waiting to to hear if they're, you know, someone's going to, you know, buy your novel. But I've written two crime novels, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, and they both cover the uh character my main character special agent uh carrie wheeler and uh the the books are about her transformation as a very flawed person with a painful past that gets involved in the case which is actually corruption in the philadelphia strip club industry and how that case affects her and causes her to have uh, issues and problems, serious problems that affect both her career, her family life, and her marriage. And uh, that second part, uh, the second part of the two-part book is uh, the, the redemption phase where she starts to forgive herself from mistakes that she made uh, as she now investigates a charity Ponzi scheme case uh, with a guy that is considered to be a very faithful, a very Christian man, and how working that case helps her to, again, forgive herself and find redemption. So that, that two-book uh, two arc uh, is uh, something that I really enjoyed writing. One book is, is, is very raw, very gritty, full of strong language and and uh, sexual assault. The second book uh, actually is, uh, you know, it's a continuation, but no strong language, no sexual, you know, um, uh, activity. Uh, and I even have uh, uh, bits of Bible passages throughout the book. And they, they sound like they're two different books, but there really is a, a beautiful flow in uh, her transformation journey. So uh, again, pay to play and, and greedy givers. And then I wrote two nonfiction books based on really motivated from the podcast itself. And the first one is called FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. And the second one is an FBI word search puzzle book that I wrote with my son. And both of these were uh, inspired from the podcast that I have. I have a podcast that I've been doing for seven and a half years, uh, nearly two, two, uh, nearly 10 million downloads and almost 300 episodes where I only exclusively uh, interview retired FBI agents. And we go through a case, an investigation from predication, from the moment the case, you know, there's enough evidence to open the case to adjudication where uh, the person is sentenced for whatever crime that uh, the FBI has investigated them. And uh, you, you, matter of fact, you have an, uh, a, a couple of people that you've interviewed on your podcast that are FBI agents, uh, excuse me, that you've interviewed on your show that are FBI agents who uh, have been guests on my podcast too. So we have that in common. But uh, <laughs> Those are all of my creative endeavors. Uh, I also like to blog about movies and TV shows that feature the FBI and kind of use those as teachable moments to show people, you know, what is the reality of how the FBI works and as opposed to what you see in, in books, TV and movies. So. Okay. Right. And one of your books is about the myths of, about the FBI. Can you yeah. talk about a few maybe and debunk some of them for viewers that think maybe about the FBI in a negative light that could shed positivity or generally speaking, what, what you've covered in your book, maybe a couple of those? Yeah, absolutely. So in doing the podcast and talking to these nearly 300 agents, uh, uh, you know, at, at the beginning, 
one of the things that we kept saying was that's not the way it happens. <laughs> you know, what, what, what happens in a TV show or a movie is not the reality. And, and we kept saying it over and over again. And, and it inspired me to kind of go through and look at what are co some common cliches about the FBI that people think they know, you know, that they, they think are true. And I came up with 20 of them. And so I'll cover the, the, the first two, which are the ones that are really prevalent. And the first one is about FBI profilers. There are so many shows and movies about serial killers and FBI profilers. And the reality is that the FBI profiler is not the active investigator. Uh, he or she is not the one that's going through a down a dark alley or in a dark and dungy basement, you know, looking for the serial killer as a profiler, they're back in their office. They're reviewing every bit of information that an FBI agent or a police detective or an investigator has gathered on a particular subject and they still don't know who did the crime. Or maybe they have a suspect, but they don't have any way of proving that this person is responsible for the particular crime. That's when they go to the FBI profiler asking for help in this, what appears to be an unsolvable case. Uh, occasionally the profiler does go out to the scene, uh, maybe to, to gather information or to, to look at you know, the, the crime scene, uh, maybe they go out and talk to the investigators and, you know, some type of a, um, a task force setting where everybody's together and, and sharing ideas, but they are not actively involved in the investigation. But there are so many movies and TV shows and books where they show it the other way around. And so that's one of the biggest myths and, 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 uh, uh, miss, uh, conceptions about uh, about the FBI is is that uh, serial killer profiler relationship. Uh, profilers are absolutely uh, important parts of solving these cases and even maybe even helping investigators once they find a subject, once they have that person arrested, helping them figure out the questions that they should ask or the way that they should approach them. They've done that study. You know, they've studied all, you know, criminals and they, they know how they act and how they respond, but that is really their role as consultants. And so that's my myth. Number one, that, uh, FBI profilers are actually hunting down serial killers. That's a myth. All right. Myth number two is that the FBI doesn't play well with others. And, uh, you know, that's again, something that you see in movies and TV shows and books where the FBI comes in and they take control and they, they tell people what to do and they steal cases and, you know, they boss people around. And that again, could be, it could be further from the truth. Uh, the FBI, I think I read the other day had like 240 some task forces where, you know, maybe a violent crime task force or crimes against children task force or, you know, uh, terror, um, joint terrorism task force, a cyber crime task force, where they work side by side with investigators from other federal agencies, from police departments, state police, and they're working side by side, many of them in FBI space being paid, uh, their overtime being paid by the FBI, uh, where they have had uh, security clearances where they're accessing our files, our information, uh, driving our vehicles. Um, they're part of the FBI task force team working together. Uh, there are very few situations where the FBI is present in a community and the law enforcement people don't already know them. Uh, that they're not already uh, hanging out and having coffee and communicating so that when something happens, when there is a mass shooting or, you know, some terrible thing that happens in that community, the FBI is already, um, you know, involved in the community. They already know them and there is uh, an, uh, a need to reach out to the FBI to utilize our resources, you know, our money, our manpower uh, to assist with the case. And there are many cases that the FBI is involved in. And at the end, that case is uh, taken through the state system. 
uh, and not even it's not even a federal uh, trial or you know uh, a federal investigation. But the FBI is there to help, and and so that's a myth. I sometimes I wonder why I didn't make that number one because that's a myth that really really is out there that is just uh, just not true. You know, the FBI is works very uh, collaborative. Co- co- <laughs> I'm missing the word, but as a collaboration with uh, both federal, state, and local law enforcement, there is no hierarchy. They're, the, they're not subordinate to the FBI. We have our jurisdiction, they have their jurisdiction, and where the, there is a, a, a common jurisdiction, then we work well together uh, with our partners. Okay. Here's a random question. How do oh. family and friends react knowing that you're an FBI agent? Well, again, most people um, who know that I am an FBI agent, uh, you know, they know I'm retired. But when I was working, uh, I have to admit that many of my friends were also FBI agents. Two of my closest friends uh, today uh, that I still uh, still socialize with, you know, are are also retired FBI agents. But of course, my neighbors and people that I meet along the way were always curious, and they they ask questions. And I was always on recruiting mode, so I was more than happy to to answer their questions and and try to you know tell them about the FBI. And now I'm basically everything that I do creatively, you know, has one mission. And that is to tell the public, to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does. So I am thrilled when people ask me questions about the FBI. Now, I don't do investigations anymore, so I'm not going to help them, not be able to help them out with solving any crimes. But I'm certainly very happy to talk about uh, what the FBI does and, and, and the great work and the sacrifices and, and the dedication of all the men and women, not just special agents, but our, our uh, support staff and our professional staff that are out there every day working hard to keep not just Americans, but uh, you know, the, the global world safe. That's what, you know, that's the truth. Okay. One thing, you have to be probably very disciplined to work cases, solve cases, and deal with challenging situations that could potentially apply in the private life as well, dealing with difficult or challenging situations. What is a habit that had a positive impact on your life and how did you develop it? Oh, I think being two things, being self-motivated and being organized. Uh, definitely self-motivated because uh, as an FBI agent, there's a lot of autonomy, you know, as far as, you know, when you go to work, how you go to work, how hard you work. Uh, There's nobody checking, you know, up on you or looking over your shoulder on a day-to-day basis. You have cases, you have assignments, and you're expected to accomplish those, to to see them through. Uh, I take it, it's still the same as it was when I was in the FBI, which is that you had a file review every 90 days. And, you know, when that that 90 days, those three months was up, you know, then your supervisor would take a look at what, uh, you know, you've accomplished, expecting there to be, you know, new interviews accomplished in the files, evidence gathered, you know, uh, at least a a framework or a pattern of where you're going to go with the investigation next. And so you have to be self-motivated in order to make sure that you keep up with your caseload. And so uh, that is definitely something from work that also transitioned to uh, my personal life, especially when it comes to deadlines and writing books and keeping the schedule for my podcast uh, going so that I can make sure I I put out my, you know, two episodes a month and, and not turn up with a situation where I don't have any guests that particular, uh, particular week. Uh, so self-motivation and, and again, that plays right along with organization of, um, you know, knowing your limits and your challenges and, and balancing what needs to be done with, you know, other things that you want to do. So yeah, uh, definitely being an FBI agent has helped me also in my personal life, accomplishing, you know, all of my, uh, all of my goals. Okay, fantastic. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and what would you say as a piece of advice you received from someone that stuck with you throughout your life and why? <sighs> piece of advice that stuck with me throughout my life, I think is knowing that you belong. You know, a lot of times and early in my career, I, you know, I even had this particular issue of, you know, imposter syndrome of, you know, wondering, you know, if uh, I am can meet up to the, the same level and the same, um, you know, standards as the other people that are around me, because we've got some rock stars, you know, in, in the FBI, some really people that are just amazing and what they do. And so sometimes you look around and you think, wow, look at her or look at him. And I think in the first four years of my career, uh, because of external things that were done and said, because, you know, the FBI is, is, is was involving, evolving back then, you know, from the Hoover era and the good old boy system into accepting women and, and minorities. And so I, I listened maybe initially too much to those external voices. And, you know, it, it took me a while to develop my own internal voice and realize that, you know, I belong there and I was just as good and capable. And once I truly believed that and some of the external voices were also saying that, you know, bosses and mentors, then, uh, you know, my career took off. And uh, again, I think I said this before, I have no regrets. I love my career. Uh, there were, you know, some uh, ups and downs every now and then, but at the end, you know, it was a wonderful career. And, uh, Proof of that is the fact that even today, you know, I'm still out there advocating for the FBI and showing people and telling people, you know, who we are and what we do. Okay. So what would you say are challenges that younger people facing these days? And what advice could you give them how to deal with those challenges, whether this would be uh, in a professional environment, seeking a new career or in private life. What's your thought on this? Well, I have, you know, three kids who are, you know, in their early 30s. So, you know, I know it's, uh, you know, finding their place and making sure that uh, there is that balance between, you know, what they do at work and, and how they, you know, take care of their family. And I think it's a little more difficult uh, than it was when, you know, I was growing up, you know, as far as the, the cost of homes and the, the cost of uh, an education and student loans and, and uh, you know, just the cost. <laughs> a lot of it is financially uh, based, you know, when it comes to challenges and issues. And um, I, I think my advice would be, you know, is to, again, and I've said this before, but, you know, find something that you love and then find a way to get someone to pay you to do that. And, you know, that's the key to happiness, you know, is to, to be able to have that balance. And it's a lot more difficult than, and than I'm saying, but I do know that, uh, you know, that being satisfied with, what you're doing and how you're supporting yourself and your family is what makes all of us, you know, uh, you know, find our happiness and, and, and feel like they found their place, you know, in this world. And it's more important now, uh, we've recognized it now more so than ever. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing, but I hope everyone, uh, has the opportunity like I did is to find a career that you really, really enjoy that enables you to also you know, have that personal balance and family life and friendships that you also really, really need to have in your life you know, to have a good life. Okay. What keeps you ticking, going, motivated when things get tough on a daily basis? Um, it you know, I'd like to be able to say just having self-satisfaction in what you're doing. But we all know that what really, really keeps you going is to have that outside 
reinforcement, that outside validation that people are enjoying what you're doing, that they care about you doing what you're doing, that the work that you're putting out there matters and that 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 work is being enjoyed and accepted by others. And so, you know, as my, you know, podcast grows in audience, as my books are purchased, as people read my blog post, uh, you know, that's very, very validating. And probably the biggest, most validating thing that had happened to me during my post FBI career was, uh, in, uh, November, less than two years ago, when the FBI Agents Association contacted me and told me that they wanted to honor me at a, a beautiful uh, gala event and name me as their honoree for um, you know excellent service to the FBI and this is after you know I got out of the FBI I got I received awards while I was in at the FBI but like I said less than 2 years ago being contacted and being you know the honoree at this beautiful beautiful banquet uh in Washington DC where I got to sit and have dinner with FBI director Christopher Ray and uh, be the keynote speaker. And there's nothing more validating the, from things that you're doing than getting a pat on the back or an award from your peers. And so uh, that is, uh, you know, something that I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. And what keeps me going, you know, even though you, you, you hear people uh, out there you know, saying things about the FBI. Well, I'm, I'm one of many, many uh, retired agents that are out there, you know, making sure people hear about the great work and the sacrifices and the dedication of the men and women uh, who work for the FBI and, you know, letting them know that, uh, you know, we're, we're doing good work and we're doing uh, great things to keep America uh, and Americans safe. Okay, congratulations on the achievements. And thank you for sharing. Is there anything that you think society could do differently, whether it's, you know, looking at the landscape of um, social media or schooling system where youngsters might end up being in a very deep hole with a depth of a university degree that might not pursue their career? What's your thought or call on this in general? Yeah, and you mentioned social media. You know, there are, of course, I use social media you know, to get word out about in the podcast and my books. Um, but there are many people who are using it, you know, to as part of their personal life. And, you know, they're being indoctrinated with uh, unhealthy images, unhealthy uh, information. And so I wish there was a way that we could, you know, balance that or control it so that young people, you know, can feel good about themselves and, and what they're doing in the world and where they, what their future looks like, uh, without being, uh, sucked into, you know, negative images from social media. Um, so I'm not quite sure how the world, it's something that I'm certainly not going to be able to solve, but I don't know how we're going to get our hands around that. But that was an issue that I didn't have to worry about, you know, having all that, those external things coming at me and making me question who I am and, and, and what I'm doing. I didn't have to do it when I was a kid. My, my kids who are now in their thirties didn't have to have as much to do with it either when they were going through. Uh, but now, uh, you know, young people are, are, you know, being affected by, you know, those issues all the time. And again, I don't know how we're going to, to solve it, but it needs to be solved. Definitely. Okay. Final question. What's Ooh. final words of wisdom? What uh, wisdom would you want to share with the younger generation in particular, apart from whatever you shared already during the interview? Is there anything you would want to say and pass on for other listeners? Yes. I want, I want them to know that they need to develop 
confidence, confidence in their selves. And let me define that for you. Confidence for me is not going into a situation and saying, I got this. I know what's going on. I got all the answers. I can figure, you know, I can do this. That's not confidence. Confidence is going into a situation and saying, oh my God, this is chaotic. There's so much stuff here that I don't know about. I've never done this before. Uh, you know, I need to, 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 you know, find my way around and then taking that breath and being confident and that, you know, you are going to be able to figure it out. You don't know everything, you know, you don't know the answers, but you are confident in yourself that you will be able to figure it out. You may have to ask questions. You may have to research. You may have to admit <laughs> that you are way over your head, but in getting the information that you need by doing the things that are going to help you make decisions and take action, you are confident that you will be able to figure it out. Okay. Thank you very much, Terry. <laughs> I truly appreciate yeah. spending the time to talk to me today, sharing all your stories and wisdom and um, shedding some more light on on a career of an FBI agent. I truly appreciate it. And I wanted to thank you for that. Well, thank you for having me. And again, the podcast is called FBI Retired Case File Review. And uh, my website is jerrywilliams.com. And so I hope you will check me out so that you can learn more about who the FBI is and, and what the FBI does. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Matt. You. Thank you.